Good morning, everybody. This is your favorite aspiring revolutionary here, a wandering author, reminding you that we are all the authors of our own lives. As always, my message remains the same. Spend less, live more, earn your freedom with frugality. Today we are on Sawmill Branch Trail. It's this nice little uh, bike path in Charleston, on like the north side of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, <coughs> still surprisingly Floridian. Even like the, the color of the streams and like the water, I guess the soil must be similar here to, to what it's like in central Florida. I'm talking like the inner part of the states. Um, so hereby opening a petition to rename the Carolinas Upper Florida. Hashtag Upper Florida. Anyways, today we're going to finally resume our discussion of ancient Greek history, moving into the Persian Wars, which is by far one of the most influential or instrumental conflicts in all of Western history. And our primary source of information on it is Herodotus and his histories, which was written about 100 years after the fact. But Herodotus was able to speak to people that had actually lived through it, and he was fairly well-traveled, especially for his era, so he knew quite a bit. <laughs> so, leading up to the Greco-Persian Wars, we, we got to talk about Persia. Um, King Cyrus the Great, the dude from the Bible, ascended to the throne in 549 BCE and toppled the Median Empire, the Medes. Within 25 years, Cyrus's conquests would include Lydia and extended from the Near East, like modern-day Afghanistan, all the way through to the Aegean. Like, they basically bordered Greece. And um, he even freed the Jews from their 50-year exile, popularized in the Bible, while conquering Babylon in 539 BCE. And after he died, his son, Cambyses, in 525, conquers Egypt. This whirlwind of territorial expansion continues um, until his son Darius is in power, and it ends up being unparalleled in modern history. The closest thing that we have to this was, will, will be Alexander the Great's campaigns, but that doesn't happen for like another thousand years almost. He's like in the seven... He's in the, he's in the 80s and not the uh, BCs. I know that much. Anyways, the Achaemenid Persian Empire rapidly becomes the world's strongest empire, and by 512, after their Macedonian conquest, they did conquer Macedon, which is Alexander the Great's future home, the Achaemenid Persian Empire exceeded even the future Roman Empire. Um, at their peak, they covered up to 10% of the planet's surface. Pretty expansive. Herodotus of Halicarnassus first wrote his accounts of the Greco-Persian Wars in the 430s BCE, about a hundred years after the original events. <laughs> but his extensive travels put him into contact with actual veterans, and he has remained our primary source even today for this era. So this war is pivotal for the West, like I said in the beginning, and there are quite a few moving pieces at play, so let's set the stage. Cyrus the Great's grandson Darius expanded Persian borders until they neighbored Greece. <laughs> and simultaneously, some shenanigans in Athens create an interesting political situation. This is known as the Ionian Rebellion to us today. <laughs> Basically, uh, Persia actually did conquer some smaller fringe Greek city-states. And these groups, the Ionians is what we call them, um, start to rebel. A group of Athenians travels out to the east in 507 to request Persian assistance against a Spartan invasion. And they promise Eratophrenes. Eratophrenes to become a vassal if he helps them. So Eratophrenes is one of these um, satraps is what they call them. He, he's basically like a governor for the Persian Empire. Now he does promise them to help but he request but he asks them to become vassals which means like lose your independence. As we've already talked about Athens was able to defeat Sparsa, Sparta or at least prevent them from conquering them without Persian assistance. And so the, whenever per Persia comes over and asks them to be their vassal, they refuse to submit because they're like, hey, we did this without you. That wasn't the deal. Now, further irritating King Darius, the Ionian Greeks rebel in 499 around this same time. And buoyed by sentiments of Greek freedom, which is, this is one of the first times we really even see any, any kind of uh, reference to anything like that. Athens supports the Ionian Greeks, but their commitment was a little half-hearted. The, Athen the Athenians only send like 20 ships. So they piss off the world's most powerful empire, and they don't really successfully help the rebels. 
uh, hashtag fail. Within five years, all the rebels are subdued by the Persian counterattacks, and things come to a head near Miletus, which is where the uh, Thales, Thales of Miletus, um, at the peak of that city's power, and we see one of the world's first large-scale naval battles, which the Athenians lose, and the Greek rebels are defeated. And after defeating the re rebellious Miletians, Darius' army raises the city to the ground, like basically erases it off the map. And part of that is like him sending a message to the Athenians. He's like, hey, uh, we're coming for you. And um, the Athenians were perturbed, to say the least. And um, we end up getting the Battle of Marathon comes next. So today we have actual races called marathons because Marathon was 24 miles away from Athens. And Darius sends a fleet of about 30,000 men, which is a massive army at the time. And this becomes one of the most pivotal battles in Western history. Miltiades is the Athenian commander, and he was responsible for a stunning Greek victory. He had ruled over Thracian uh, Chernoses, which is Persian now until Persia came over, and then he returned to Athens before becoming a general. So Miltiades kind of had some insider knowledge about how the Persians worked. And during this whole time, Darius, emperor of Persia, is planning to invade Greece. And in 491, he sends over some envoys to all the major Greek city-states and demands submissions. And if you've seen the movie 300, you've seen this historical moment. Uh, this is the point where Leonidas comes out and yells, this is Sparta, and like kicks the dude into the, the doom pit. <laughs> um, and uh, the king of Persia didn't take it very kindly. Not in the movie and not in real life. So hashtag historically accurate. Sparta and Athens did actually execute the, the envoys when they arrived. And two years later in 490, a large Persian army and fleet launches their assault, moving through Eritrea and landing on the beaches of Marathon, only 20 more, 24 miles from Athens. Now, here's where the actual history of the marathon, the race, comes in. Athens dispatches a runner to Sparta asking for assistance, but gets denied. And Miltiades marches with his Athenian hoplites to meet the Persian for forces. Now, unfortunately, a lot of, uh, like, Herodotus and ancient historians, they leave out a lot of the juicy details of the battle, so we don't really know exactly what happened. Other than we know that the Greeks won... And uh, even though they were outnumbered, possibly by two to one, as, as much as two to one. And they don't, they don't just win, they decisively win the battle. And that leads to the question, um, does your belief have anything to do with your fighting ability, right? So the Greeks were fighting for their freedom. Darius has this massive army that on paper looks like it would wipe the Greeks off the table. But... These are all different peoples. Most of them are forced to fight for an empire that isn't theirs. And, um, you know, you've got to ask yourself, did this... Were, were the Greeks able to overcome the, the Persian advantage in numbers strictly by belief? And does that... Not, and I, personally, I think it probably did. Uh, I know for sure that I would not want to fight for a king. Um, I really wouldn't want to fight at all. I'm pretty much a pacifist. But... Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to fight for a king, and fighting for my freedom is probably one of the only ways that you could motivate me to fight, especially if I was going up against superior numbers. Anyways, now since Athens defeated the Persians at Marathon, they were able to whisk their army back home. So Persia lands an army at Marathon, and they send another one around the back. But instead of seeing a victorious Persian army when they get there, this secondary Persian army sees the Athenian army standing there all proud after having defeated the initial invasion. And this demonstrates the, uh, the famous phalanx, the Greek phalanx, that it is a serious force to be reckoned with. That this, it, at the time, the Greeks were not like a huge world power. They were like kind of like a minor. It'd be like Mexico defeating the United States or something comparable. Um, Sparta arrives late with only 2,000 men. So Athens did all of the marathon to discover a victorious Athens who suffered a mere 192 casualties to Persia's 6,000. It's a lot of, it's a, it's a huge um, difference in the kill-death ratio. They would have been great as uh, e-gamers, right? 
Athenian prestige exploded on the international stage as a result of these victories, and the spoils of war paid for the construction of a new temple at Delphi. So they benefited from this. Now, we go into the next phase. So Darius, very angry about uh, his defeat at Marathon, and he tells his son, Xerxes, which is the actual Persian king we see in the movie 300, hey, you've got to take care of these Greeks. They, they got it coming for him. And, yeah, so embarrassed by defeat, Darius tasks his son Xerxes with conquering the Greeks on his deathbed. He, be he begins constructing a massive canal in 483, signaling his intentions. Hashtag alarming. Imagine you're the Athenians, and all of a sudden, the Persians are building this huge canal so they can send their forces straight over to you. <clears throat> Last time, a huge portion of the Persian army was destroyed because their ships were sunk off the coast. Now they're just digging a canal so they can send them straight through. And meanwhile, a rising politician in Athens, Themistocles, begins pushing for a stronger navy, and he moves their naval base from Phalarium to Piraeus in 493. So Themistocles ends up becoming pivotal for the upcoming phase of the Greco-Persian Wars. Now, after Miltiades dies, who was the general at Marathon of Gangrene in 489, Themistocles' power, stature, and uh, influence grow unabated, and he serves multiple consecutive terms as a general. If you guys remember whenever I talked about the Athenian constitution, they didn't allow multiple terms unless you were a general. And so Themistocles is one of the first politicians that really shows us the power that generals can have in Athens, even though they're democratic, because they lack terms. And in this case, it's beneficial because Themistocles does help them defeat the Persians. So Themistocles also negotiates an instrumental settlement when a new silver vein is discovered. Typically in Athens, what would happen is they would basically hand out stimmy checks if they, got, if they found like a new silver vein. They found one in this place called Lorium, which belonged to Athens. And instead of using it for the stimmy checks, he convinces the people of Athens to take on a massive uh, obligation and... and he basically turns him into a, um, a naval power. He gets them to like commission to build 500 triremes. And at the time, triremes are these like fancy top of the line ship. Uh, before this, the ships were these combined vessels that they used for like war and commerce. A trireme is like your, the, the stuff that you see in the movies where uh, they've got two sets of oars. It's about 200 men stay on these boats, and the whole point of them is to ram into each other. Anyways, the point is, is he basically just bought Athens 500 F, you know, 16s, and turns them into the preeminent naval power, at least in Greece at the time. And this shift in policy may not sound like a huge deal, but it had huge implications. One, it does turn Athens into a massive naval power. Two, to do all of this, before the navy was owned by private individuals, but because of the cost and like the complexity of coordination, this ships it, this sends it from uh, an individual thing and it puts it into the hands of the government. Three, all of a sudden Athens is forced to maintain better relationships with their neighbors. They didn't have like all the wood they needed to build these ships, so they had to be friendly to other cities because those are the places that had the stuff they needed. And it commits all of the Athenian manpower to the navy. Um, and Plutarch actually talks about this, and he tells us an interesting story where some young Athenian nobles, the children of Themistocles, donate their horse girdles because they weren't going to need them. Like, they donate them to the temple because they're not going to need them in the upcoming war because they're not going to be fighting on horseback. They're going to be unmounted um, navy marines basically. And, uh, yeah, so then we have the Hellenic League. So at this point, everybody knows Persia's on the way. They're afraid. And so finally in 481, Sparta summons a Greek Congress, getting all of the different Greek city-states to come together, and they form an alliance that today we call the Hellenic League which expressed a sense of shared Greekness for the first time. This new alliance, uh, the name wasn't used back then in the Hellenic League, but it w that's what we call it today. And afterward, they send Greek spies to Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey, 
to assess Xerxes' strength. And Sparta is chosen as the league's military leader because of their experience running the Peloponnesian League. If you remember the last time, um, Peloponnesian League was, was like a, an empire ran by Sparta, basically. And um, they promised to retaliate against any Greek states that Medes, which remember um, the Medes was a Greek place that basically helped the Persians come to power. Uh, so, and Herodotus, as Xerxes approaches and passes through the city of Sardis, he sends out an envoy wave to many Greek city-states, and most of them just bend the knee. Uh, in fact, by the time Persia actually reaches Greece, there are more Greeks fighting for the Persian army than there are for the Greek cause. And that's because they submitted to Persia and they were required to send out troops with his army. And Herodotus claims that the Persians were traveling with an army of 1.7 million foot soldiers. Now, that's clearly overstated. Um, it would be basically impossible for an army of that size to move around back then. Even to feed that many people would be basically impossible. <laughs> but it's very po a more realistic assessment might be something like 150,000 soldiers. And because of this, everyday people were losing their minds. And even the oracle at Delphi claims that Persia's going to win. They tell Sparta that they're going to lose their kings or that they're going to be crushed. Thessaly and all of northern Greece submit to Persia before they even get there. And famously, an Athenian emissary to the oracle at Apollo was told a wooden wall would keep them safe. And uh, in the end, only 29 Greek states joined the Hellenic League. And more Greeks end up fighting on the Persian side than on the Greeks. So tomorrow, we'll be moving into uh, the, one of the most famous battles of all history, Thermopylae, which is where the Battle of 300 was, uh, got its inspiration from. And um, we'll be moving through the Greek and Persian Wars, uh, talking about why we have freedom and democracy today. Because if Persia had won at the Battle of Marathon or at the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, democracy and all of that may not have evolved, most likely would not have evolved the way that it has. So, even though this is 2,000 years ago, it's hard to, uh, it's impossible to overstate just how much of an impact these events have on all of our lives today. So, that's really all I've got for you guys today. My, my takeaways is that, uh, I didn't realize that by the time the Persians' main army under Xerxes was coming over, that more Greeks were fighting for him than against him. So it makes, uh, it makes the Athenian and Spartan cause for freedom even more inspiring, in my opinion. But, uh, yeah, this is a wandering author here reminding you that we are all the authors of our own lives. As always, my message remains the same. Spend less, live more on your freedom with frugality. What are you guys doing in order to inspire, uplift, and empower your community today? Because this world isn't changing unless we all do our part. And you can count on me to do mine daily. Till next time, I love you.